I'm Dominic, uh, as introduced. Um, so, quickly, first question, you know, why do we need synthetic assets? Um, synthetic assets are uh, crypto tokens that represent real-world assets like gold, Facebook stock, uh, pretty much anything that you see in the traditional financial world. And the answer is, if we have high-quality synthetic assets, we can power um, open, worldwide, trustless finance based upon smart contracts. Um, it's what we call autonomous finance. So next question, what does autonomous finance do? Um, well, once we have synthetic assets, uh, such as uh, D-Google, D-Gold, we can obviously um, enable decentralized trading, hedging, derivatives, that kind of thing. Um, people can use them for saving and investing, and we can create all kinds of interesting, innovative consumer applications. Another um, thing we can do is we can create price-stable cryptocurrencies. So you might imagine that uh, a cryptocurrency called Phi was created by blending D-Gold, D-USD, that kind of thing. And this would be liquid, and it would be price-stable, so we could use it as a unit of account, as a medium of exchange, and a store of value, and that in turn could be used to power other fiduciary smart contracts. Uh, prediction market could be used as prediction market debt collateral um, for money, transfer and payments, that kind of thing. So, we're looking at the kind of basic architecture we're talking about. Uh, you know, traditional financial assets are you know, underpinned by clearing systems, exchange systems, the thing called the DTCC, broker dealers, banks. It's a sort of very complex, slightly antiquated uh, infrastructure. And when two people um, transfer or trade these assets, of course, it's going through a whole series of middlemen. And really, they're two customers of this financial system that are, that are transferring these assets. And what we'd like to do is um, have synthetic versions of the real-world financial assets that mirror their value securely, um, but can be traded peer-to-peer -peer without middlemen. So, uh, you know, we'd like to have a mirror copy of all of, all of the major um, financial assets. And you know, th through this, we um, can get some interesting properties. You know, rather than uh, one to three days settlement time, we might get 20 seconds settlement time. We might get rid of uh, commission completely on, on transfers. Uh, we might enable people to have fractional assets. And even something like fractional assets can be a really big deal. And you know, if you look at a, a Google stock at 600, I, don't, I haven't looked recently, but $650 or something, um, if you're living in a BRICS country, you may not even have $650 to invest. So you perhaps like to buy you know, 0 0.05 of a Google stock or something like that. Um, so think other things too, like 24-7 you know, trading, right? I mean, it's, if you have traded, it's very restrictive only being able to tr trade with... with access to good liquidity, sort of nine to five. The, the key aspect of the system is that it's open and, and, and trustless, and, and that enables permissionless innovation. And, and that's very, very different to what we have today. The, the current system is um, very restricted, uh, it's expensive, it's hegemonic, and, and you certainly don't have permissionless innovation. So the question is, you know, how can we, how can we get to this place where people can uh, truly innovate and provide access to um, people that don't really have access at the moment. So returning to the synthetic assets, uh, to create autonomous finance, we use synthetic assets. And then the question is, well, how do we create these synthetic assets? And there are three main uh, mechanisms for creating synthetic assets. The first one is colored coins, which is uh, quite widely known. Uh, the second one is cryptocurrency collateralized instruments, and the third one is DAO-issued assets. So returning to uh, colored coins, colored coins are really uh, bearer shares in uh, cryptographic form. Uh, they're issued by some company who promises to pay the bearer on demand whatever the asset represents. It could be a dollar. For example, Tether does this. It could be a, an equity. Um, and of course, this results in some pretty severe regulatory problems because the issuer is based in some jurisdiction. Uh, if it facilitates exchange, it could be uh, subject to money transmitter laws, exchange regulations, that kind of thing. It's a single point of failure. Do you really trust uh, this issuer? You know, you've given them your money and they promise to pay you on demand whatever the crypto token represents, but you know, you're really trusting that they'll be true to their word. 
It's got poor fungibility often as well. I mean, if you, if you have a, a tether and you have a Chase dollar, Chase have talked about creating a blockchain with, with dollars on. Are these the same thing? Would, is, is one tether equal in value to one Chase dollar? Um, prob probably not, so you don't have fungibility. And perhaps the biggest problem of all is that there are seizure risks because uh, you've got this single company custodying everyone's assets, and you might imagine that an agency comes along and says, we don't like this user, can you seize their gold coin, for example? And there's a problem there because that gold coin may have been used as collateral in some smart contract, and you can imagine a kind of web of dependencies fanning out from, from, from this uh, contract where the gold coin's been used as collateral. So we don't like colored coins. Um, Cryptocurrency collateralized instruments are um, uh, instruments where you know they're pegged some kind of they've got some kind of peg to an external asset, you know, for example, Facebook stock or something like that, and they're collateralized by a liquidity provider in cryptocurrency. And the idea is that you know if the value of the stock goes up, uh, the liquidity provider will re-collateralize the instrument. If the value of the cryptocurrency goes down, they'll re-collateralize the instrument and so on. Um, but there are, there are a number of problems with it, too. I mean, there's uh, very expensive because you've got to put the collateral into the instrument. You've also got to hedge the collateral on the real world market. So you, 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 you actually have double the amount of capital in this thing. Um, there's an ongoing roll cost. You know, every time you have a margin call or something like that, you know, there's spreads involved and it's constant friction that's just leaching uh, money out of the system. Um, the biggest problem, though, is you, you've got all these kind of recursive death spirals. So, uh, Cryptocurrency really, at least at this stage, is far too volatile to be used as collateral. And it might be that, you know, five, ten years when there's a huge velocity due to, um, you know, vast numbers of dApps executing, it'll be much more stable because uh, the velocity of the currency will underpin its value and make it, you know, and, and, and reduce the volatility. But for now, it's, it's uh, not suitable. And the, the idea often is that, you know, crypto equity will be offered. Uh, will be issued as a last resort and injected into these instruments to collateralize them when the liquidity providers can't do that. But of course, the problem is that the, uh, the problems with uh, liquidity providers will be correlated with um, a decrease in the value of the equity. So you get a kind of recursive death spiral. So the third option is uh, DAO-issued assets. Um, I don't know if you if you're putting your hand up, you've heard of a DAO. Yeah, great. So it's, it's, for those who don't know, it's, it's a uh, decentralized autonomous organization, which is uh, a bunch of smart contracts that fulfill many of the roles of an organization, but they're not controlled by any individual or organization. Um, probably didn't have time to explain exactly how this works, but We've got a user, they're talking to what we call a, a, a de-asset API. The de-asset API is pushing calls through to a de-asset exchange, which falls through to a de-asset DAO. And all of this is autonomous financial logic that's executing in the cloud. For the most part, we hope the de-assets would be uh, recirculated on the exchange, but when, for example, you want to buy some asset and there isn't a, um, uh, an ask in the exchange, it falls through to the DAO. The DAO can generate new de-assets and redeem them, and it does that by hedging its position in the real world by interacting with liquidity providers who um, essentially um, sell its CFDs and close them on demand. So it's sort of zero-based CFDs, so the, the redemption value is from zero to the price. And these CFD traders uh, exist within a compliance framework. Um, there's an association that governs them. And you know they deal with broker dealers, and there's multi-sig schemes to stop them withdrawing money, and all kinds of other things. And the requirements are that they hedge their positions in the real world by buying the underlying asset. The key thing here, though, is that when you buy a D asset, if you buy a Facebook coin, there's no mapping between your Facebook coin and any particular Facebook stock held by um, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a brokerage account. Um, and the de asset itself doesn't give you any voting rights in, in a company, doesn't give you any dividends. It's just a synthetic asset whose value happens to mirror the real world asset. Um, just a quick note on what, what autonomous financial code is, and I think it's an important point. Um, 
it really mustn't be controlled by developers or organizations. It probably has some voting shares, which enable it to vote on the logic used and things like that, but it cannot be controlled by any entity. And it must exist pretty much as a, as a network protocol in the cloud. And it's, the regulation then falls on the entities that access it in, in, in local jurisdictions. Um, and that's pretty much the only way you can create a global financial system. You can't have some kind of global financial system um, which is subject to the regulation of every you know, several hundred com countries in the world. Um, I kind of skip, I'm going to skip past this quickly, but um, this is just talking about a decentralized KYC scheme um, in which, of course, you have like, KYC users, KYC providers, and voting shares that uh, decide upon uh, who can be a KYC provider. And finally, um, just like to introduce this idea of a liquid wallet, um, which is an example of a consumer application that you can create using synthetic assets. And this illustrates um, what's possible and how you can create different kinds of uh, mass market consumer application using this kind of technology than you might be able to create uh, using existing facilities. So um, here's a liquid wealth wallet. And because all of these um, different assets um, are convertible to uh, cash form, they can be treated as cash. So we've got a single balance up the top, which um, of course isn't real dollars, it's DUSD. And we can spend that you know, through gateways um, you know, where money's exported as Bitcoin and passed to a debit card. And in the wallet, we have some DUSD, we have some Apple stock, we have some Facebook stock, we have a, a kind of derivative that generates interest based on margin lending. We have a folder, which is a kind of crowdfunding folder for a bunch of friends to crowdfund a Burning Man camp. Um, and this illustrates some of the stuff that's possible. So when you spent money from this wallet, it would go to each of these items and liquidate a little bit. Um, but, but of course, you can do all kinds of great things. You, know, you can lock items, you can lock folders. And, and generally speaking, it's programmable. So you can imagine um, creating uh, a folder called My Car Fund, right? If you're saving up for a car, and you you might program that folder so that every time your every time your balance goes over ten thousand dollars for a full day, it's it sweeps fifty dollars from your balance and sticks it into your My Car Fund folder. Um, so it's kind of um, kind of a merger of a checking account, a savings account, and an investment solution. Um, which you can configure um, to behave in exactly the way you want and furthermore um, addresses the issue which a lot of people have, that you have uh, you know, money lying around in your bank account but you just don't have the time to send it to a wealth management solution uh, or you need the liquidity on hand. Um, and yeah, that's it from me. I think I've stayed with you. <laughs>